Good morning. Uh, this hearing is called to order, um, and uh, we thank everyone for their participation. Our prayers and support go out to the people of Southern California who have suffered so much in the recent deadly fires and are bracing for more this weekend, according to the latest forecasts. Last week's 22 fires displaced a half a million people and caused at least $1.5 billion in damages. Not since Hurricane Katrina slammed the Mississippi and Louisiana coasts have so many suffered from extreme weather. At least one of the smaller fires appears to have been caused by a young boy playing with matches. And California is rightly concerned with sorting out what started with arson from what started with lightning or power line collapse or other common causes of such fires. That is not what this hearing is about. Global warming does not cause an individual fire or hurricane, and global warming is not the cause of the California fires. Global warming's contribution to wildfires is more subtle and more complex, and scientists and the firefighting community are just beginning to tease out of this complex climate record those factors which may be influencing these natural disasters in unnatural ways. In fact, the impact of global warming on the West is more evident in places other than Southern California where drought and fire appear to have been commonplace in the undisturbed ecosystem. There is no doubt that a century of stifling the natural fire regime of western forests and the increasing numbers of people living in fire-prone areas has made the impact of wildfires worse. The questions before us today are how will, fire, how will wildfires change in a warming world and what can we do to reduce their impact? We can learn something about a warmer future by looking at the recent past. As temperatures have risen in the West, the frequency, intensity, and area burned by wildfires has increased. Recent scientific studies have found that since 1986, Western fire season is 78 days longer. There has been a fourfold increase in fires larger than 1,000 acres. There has been a sixfold increase in areas and acres burned, and over the last century, fire uh, has increased uh, to the point where the projections for the next century is that fire will probably burn two or three times as much land in the West as it does today. Some of the most dramatic increases in fire frequency and intensity are occurring in higher elevations, where fire suppression has not historically been used underscoring the influence of global warming rather than past forest policies on wildfires. Global warming influences wildfires in a variety of ways, through increased drought and, and reduced uh, rainfall, earlier spring snowmelt, and better breeding conditions for insect infestations. These factors combined to create a longer and more extreme dry season, resulting in tinderbox conditions ripe for ignition. It appears that global warming is stacking the wildfire deck, making it more likely that when an errant spark flies, we will be dealt a losing hand. And losing to Mother Nature can be expensive. As we learned in one of our first hearings, Damages from extreme weather alone have likely cost our nation $800 billion since the 1980s. In addition to property losses, fires increasingly eat up the Forest Service budget as they have to spend more and more to fight them. In 2006, it spent a record $2.5 billion just for fighting wildfires. Data points and dollar signs aren't the only measure of the changing nature of fires in the West. The men and women on the fire line have experienced the impact of warming temperatures firsthand. Tom Boatner, a 30-year firefighting veteran and chief of fire operations for the federal government, said in a recent interview, we've had climate change beat us over and over the last 10 
of 15 years. We know what we are seeing. What can Congress do to help cope with this increasing threat? Policies that improve forest management on the edge of communities and help make these communities more resilient are crucial, but not comprehensive. We will ultimately reach the limit of our, of our adaptive capacity, which is why we must act now to begin to address the underlying disease of global warming, not just the symptoms. Congress has the opportunity to send an energy bill to the President that could, by 2030, reduce U.S. global warming pollution by up to 40 percent of what we must do to save the planet. This will lay the foundation for achieving more significant cuts through a subsequent cap, auction, and trade bill. We have already set in motion uh, changes to our western forests. Now we must adopt smart policies that will help avoid the unmanageable and manage the unavoidable impacts of global warming. And now I would like to turn to recognize the ranking member of the Select Committee on Global Warming, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Like all natural disasters, the recent wildfires in Southern California have taken an enormous toll in lives and property damage. With seven dead, 2,000 homes destroyed, 640,000 people displaced, and possibly up to $2 billion in damages, wildfires have again showed that they are a deadly threat to people living in the arid west, just as hurricanes have proven to be a deadly and destructive threat to people living on the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. Death and destruction aren't the only things that wildfires and hurricanes share in common. They are now both used as poster children for global warming. I'm glad the chairman has said that global warming didn't cause the wildfires, unlike the comments made by the Senate Majority Leader uh, over in the other body a couple of weeks ago. While both of these severe weather events are common and occur naturally, global warming alarmists are using these natural disasters to promote regulations that will have little or no effect on the forces of nature. In regards to global warming, there are many similarities between hurricanes and wildfires. In both cases, there are complicated natural events influenced by a variety of factors. And yes, in both cases, warmer temperatures can create conditions that would amplify the effects of these disasters. But just like hurricanes, there's no concrete scientific link between the Southern California wildfires and global warming. And even if there were, members of Congress would be fooling themselves to think that by passing a bill to supposedly do something about global warming, they would have any measurable impact on the ground in Southern California. What would have a measurable impact in California and in other parts of the country are smart forestry practices. Liberal environmentalists have long fought to prevent management of our forestry which exacerbates many problems that make forest fires worse. By allowing forests to go unmanaged, it allows for grasses, underbrush, dead trees, and other growth to serve as kindling for these fires. As the wildfires were raging last week, the Los Angeles Times reported that forest thinning helped the resort town of Lake Arrowhead to avoid the worst of the damage. The Times described the area as, quote, an island in a sea of destruction, unquote. By creating what are known as fuel breaks, residents of Lake Arrowhead were able to see firsthand the effect of forest thinning as they watched billowing fires stop nearly dead in their tracks. Forest thinning produces a tangible, measurable environmental benefit. I wouldn't support any global warming legislation that doesn't result in measurable environmental damages. There's another similarity between hurricanes and wildfires that Dr. Stephen Running points out in his testimony today. Just like hurricanes, the damage suffered by wildfires is often a result of where you live. Live by the ocean and the chances of your house getting knocked down by a hurricane are much greater than those more inland. The same is true who build in the wildland urban interface where the dangers of wildfires are greatest. As the fires raged, the Los Angeles Times also posed the question of whether global warming was part of the problem. The answer appears to be a qualified no. Quoting in the journal Science, the Times reported that unlike the rest of the West, there has been no increase in wildfire frequency in Southern California. 
Pointing out the potential problems of global warming is easy. What would also be easy is preparing for natural disasters through adaptive management techniques, like forest thinning and fuel breaks for wildland fires. The hard part is finding ways to promote the development of energy sources that don't emit CO2 and other greenhouse gases. If we can do this, we would truly be doing something about global warming. I thank the Chair and yield back the balance of my time. Great. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree with uh, my distinguished friend. Uh, from uh, Wisconsin about the concerns of development. In fact, I talked to that uh, to one of the LA Times reporters. We kind of joked, I have this conversation with him about every year when these firefighters break out uh, and we don't do anything about the problem with that interface. In fact, we have so created a problem that it's hard to characterize these as natural disasters because we make them more likely, we make them worse, and we allow more and more and more people to be in the flame zone. Uh, global warming puts this in perspective where we're not going to be able to ignore it any longer. And it's not in a, any amount of uh, intelligent forestry is not going to save us if we continue to have more development. Two-thirds of the new buildings in Southern California over the past decade were on land susceptible to wildfires. If last week's fires had burned in the same location in 1980, there would have been 61,000 homes. By 2000, that number had uh, risen to 106,000, and by this year, it was 125,000. Now, we've got to get our heads around the fact that uh, we are having a situation we're making worse that is compounded by global warming, and the federal government is actually producing a malpractice. We're lavishing money on fighting fires. Uh, we are not spending money on disaster protection to make them less likely. We save $4 for each dollar we put in prevention, and we keep putting people back in harm's way. We subsidize development. We don't have reasonable regulation. And then we bemoan the fact that we have these firefighters and we call them natural disasters. I think that is abuse of the term. It's not fair to nature. Uh, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today uh, to sort of deal with the big picture. Because if we continue to have more and more people located in the flame zone, the fastest growing states are areas that sub are subjected to persistent drought, subjected to wildfire, and of course we're going to have the floods when the rain finally does come in Southern California. Then we're going to be paying a lot of money to help people with mudslides uh, and call it an act of nature. Uh, I really appreciate this hearing. I hope we can continue to look at this through the prism of global warming because I think it's going to up the ante and maybe finally Congress will stop practicing malpractice when it deals with these disasters. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciated your comments in the opening statement vis-a-vis -vis the problems we have in our national forests. And some of us actually have been working to try and change those policies and look forward to working with you in those endeavors. I frankly think that passage of the Healthy Forest Restoration Act, which I know not everyone on this committee supported, um, provided for the wildfire community planning process to allow communities to come together and deal with the wildland urban interface. And it's been quite successful where it's been implemented in communities across America and has really resulted in fuel reductions and better planning processes. And that is what is needed. But the bigger problem really rests on the state of America's national forests. Teddy Roosevelt would be rolling over in his grave right now if he could see what's happened to his great forest reserves, which he called for active management upon. Um, right now, of the 192 million acres in the national forest system, 52 million acres are at risk to catastrophic wildfire. Wildfire like this depicted behind me is the Egley Fire burned this summer out in Central Oregon, 140,000 acres burned. This did not come about because of homes there. This came about because of a lightning strike, and it burned over a prior burn. 140,000 acres were consumed. Um, these children standing here are the future. Uh, Caleb Presley, 10, Ashley Presley, 6. They're the uh, grandkids of the uh, Harney County judge, Steve Grasty. 
This is the future force that we're giving them because of inaction, uh, because of failed practices in the past, because of litigation, uh, because we lock it up, leave it, and let it burn and do nothing about it. Now, some of us on this committee, my colleague, Ms. Herseth, uh, uh, and I worked together on the Forest Emergency Recovery and Research Act, which passed overwhelmingly in the House, the bipartisan bill to go in after these fires, remove the dead, burned trees where it makes sense environmentally and where we can still get value out of the timber because we're going to use wood in America. We ought to use the burned dead wood, not import illegally harvested wood from across the globe, which is what we're doing today in America. We're using that wood harvested illegally and furniture we buy back here. So changes have to occur if we're going to deal with carbon emissions, if we're going to make our forests healthier, if we're going to keep up with the increasing temperatures that are occurring, and the Forest Service tells us that is what is happening, then forests in the West, especially the eastern side uh, of my district certainly, have got to be managed better um, if we're going to keep pace and have uh, the appropriate fire regimes. And at some point I'll get into the IPCC language because I think it makes the case as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Sandlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll forego an opening statement to add additional time to my questioning. Thank you. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York State, Mr. Hall, for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also will save my time for questions. The gentleman's time is reserved. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm pleased that you're having this hearing today because I also represent uh, California, Southern California, and I'm very pleased that we did not suffer this time around the enormous uh, fires that uh, surrounded uh, Los Angeles County. Uh, yesterday we heard um, from some folks that came by to talk to our California delegation about how we could better manage uh, this particular uh, rising crisis that continues to plague areas like Southern California. And one that I'd be interested in hearing from our witnesses is what we need to do to help provide more assistance to our state forest, uh, you know, wild service, uh, what plan, management that we need, the tools that we need. I understand that the Bush administration has cut back by 18 percent on funding for the management plans that our states should have in place. So I'm very concerned and want to hear about that. Um, I'm very interested also in how we can help distressed communities, low-income communities, so that they have fully implemented evacuation plans and, and that they too understand the importance of security and, and understand that they, have, they are also a part of this, this solution and would like to hear more about that. Um, I had the uh, privilege of being on C-SPAN just a couple of minutes ago and many people do not understand what is happening to our climate change that is occurring and the impacts. And I understand that some people will say there isn't a correlation between the fires and global warming, but we do see in Southern California and other arid areas in the Southwest where we've experienced drought-like conditions for the past seven and six years. And we continue to not focus on that and do uh, preparation for these disastrous fires. So I think that it's a combination of different things Better planning, of course, better resources, and better management at the local level, and coordination with the state and federal level, and of course, funding to implement that, I think, are very important. That's all I want to say, and I look forward to hearing from the witnesses. Thank you. A gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I certainly want to thank you for holding this hearing today. This is certainly what has happened in Southern California is of utmost interest, uh, certainly to our entire nation, to the entire world, quite frankly. Uh, and if it's not inappropriate, I might just take one minute to formally put myself on the record to ask you to consider a hearing for a different topic at another time, and that is regarding the Great Lakes. We have historic low lake levels. I'll just take one quick minute. Unbelievably low lake levels that is happening in the Great Lakes, which is one-fifth, 20 percent of the freshwater supply of the entire planet. Much of it can be uh, attributable, I think, to climate change, weather, uh, changing weather patterns, what have, it, have you. Some of it is man-made, but it is having an unbelievable negative impact on many segments of society. And I would just, uh, I, I know we're going to talk about wildfires today, but I would like to be on record Thank as you. asking you to consider such I, a hearing I, in, the, in the future. Thank you. I abs absolutely, we will. Um, in part, I'm responding in this hearing to the request from Mr. Walton and Mr. Blumenauer that we spend more time on the forestry-related issues, and, uh, and I will try my best to accommodate that request as well. Let me now turn and recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my heart certainly goes out to the families who lost their homes in last week's fire 
uh, you know, whether it's fires, uh, hurricanes, earthquakes, any of these human tragedies are something that we uh, feel deeply about and that we want to try to avoid as much as possible. Uh, as uh, large fires, uh, are these large fires a result of global warming? Well, we can't really answer that definitively, can we? Certainly the fires, the droughts, the large frequent storms are consistent with the theory of global warming. Uh, and we will indeed see more of these large fires. We will see more hurricanes. Uh, we will see droughts. Uh, and it's incumbent upon us to understand what's going on here, to adapt and to mitigate. Uh, and I think that this hearing is a good step in that direction. I uh, thank the panelists for coming today, and I look forward to your testimony. Thank you. I reserve the balance of my time. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Um, and I don't see any other members seeking uh, recognition, and I will then turn as a result to our first witness, uh, and that witness is Gail Kimball. Um, she is um, Chief Gail Kimball. She, she is the 16th chief and the first female chief of the U.S. Forest Service. Her long and distinguished career working in federal forestry began in 1974. She has extensive experience working in our nation's forests throughout the West, including Alaska, Oregon, Colorado, and Washington. She assumed her current position as Chief of the U.S. Forest Service on February 5, 2007. We welcome you, Chief. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman and members of the Select Committee, thank you for inviting me today. I will focus my oral remarks on what the Forest Service is doing to address interactions between wildfire and climate change. First, I would like to note that I am, an, I am accompanied by Dr. Susan Kennard. Susan is the National Program Leader for Fire Ecology Research, right behind me. And I'm also accompanied by Mark Roundsville, who is my Deputy Director for Fire and Aviation for the agency. And I also must disclose, because I understand there are some baseball fans, that everything I know about baseball I learned in Fenway Park. Um, oh. I think she learned about ecology she learned in Yellowstone Park, okay? So we, we just give, you know, deference to which park teaches which subject, you know? So I think. Cheap shot. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Scientists tell us that climate change may increase the incidence and severity of wildfires in some parts of the United States. Decisions made today by resource managers and policymakers will have implications throughout the next century. I am a forester with over 33 years of experience, but I'm not a scientist. Still, the Forest Service has some of the best scientists and research available on forests and climate change. For example, Forest Service scientists participated in the in Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. They were recently awarded a Nobel Peace Prize, and they concluded that disturbances from pests, diseases, and fire are projected to have increasing impacts on forests with longer fire seasons and large increases in area burned. While we have much to learn about the interactions between climate change and wildfire, we are taking science-based, adaptive management approaches today to reduce the impact of wildfires, to mitigate the impacts of climate change on our nation's forests and grasslands, and to improve the forest potential for mitigating the effects of climate change. I was in Southern California last week, observing what is being done to suppress those fires, and talking with fire crews and fire managers about their efforts. Along with the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection and other agency partners, the firefighting, firefighters are doing everything within their power and qualifications to contain those fires. Without question, we are seeing more wildfires covering more acres in recent years, a result of extended drought and the accumulation of fuels. Climate change is certainly a, a contributor to the factors affecting the current fire situation, but more me needs to be known about the details. We need more information before we can conclusively answer the question of the relationship between wildfire and climate change. A recent study by the Department's Office of, Investigator, of Inspector General found that the majority of the Forest Service's fire suppression costs were related to fighting fire in the wildland-urban interface. According to our recently published National Forests on the Edge, 
just published last week. Almost 22 million acres of rural private lands, about 8 percent of all private lands, located within 10 miles of the National Forest boundaries are projected to undergo increases in housing densities by 2030. This, coupled with climate change factors of drought and warmer temperatures, will increase the complexity and the costs of firefighting. The Forest Service has conducted over two decades of focused climate research, three decades of air pollution research, and has long experience in scientific assessments that provide a firm scientific foundation for addressing the challenges of forest and rangeland management relative to climate change. Forest Service research and development continues to study the interactions between factors affecting fire behavior and the potential effects of changing climate on fire patterns and vegetation. There are important knowledge gaps we must address, such as wide variability in the estimates of fire emissions. While we have information for a few systems, we do not have good information on all systems on how burn severity affects emissions or vegetation recovery. Current models of smoke dispersion need to be improved to more accurately predict the potential effects on human health. We are developing improved projections of the impacts of changing precipitation patterns on forest ecosystems to help us adapt to and mitigate those changes. In partnership with other land managers, we are working to identify the landscape level forest conditions most likely to sustain forest ecosystems in a changing climate. The IPCC in its fourth assessment report states, in the long term, a sustainable forest management strategy aimed at maintaining or increasing forest carbon stocks while producing an annual sustained yield of timber, fiber, or energy from the forest will generate the largest sustained mitigation benefit. Forestry can make a very significant contribution to a low-cost global mitigation portfolio. It is important to note that not only can forests store carbon and help mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, they can also provide clean water, wildlife habitat, and recreational opportunities, among other significant environmental and economic amenities. Other elements of a broad strategy include treating fuels to reduce the threat of wildfire to community and to other forest values, keeping forests in forest, keeping forests healthy, and reforesting degraded lands. While recent wildfire activity reflects some of what we have experienced with climate change, management of fire and vegetation and thoughtful restoration, including that of burned areas, can and should be part of the solution. Communities of vastly different interests across the country are witnessing changes in the forests they care about and they are coming together to develop guidelines to support forest restoration. The Forest Service has focused resources on improving forest health and the resilience of ecosystems to climate change. Many of the approaches we use to reduce fire risk and restore fire affected systems also improve forest health and productivity and increase the resilience of America's forests to changing climate. Although forests are not the solution to controlling greenhouse gases, forest and sustainable forest management must be part of a broad set of strategies that contribute to the solution. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss these issues with the committee, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chief, for uh, being here at this time. Let me uh, turn first and, uh, uh, and uh, recognize myself and ask you, do you consider wildfire a threat to public welfare? Wildfire, you know, certainly in the last uh, several years, we've seen an increase in the size of wildfire and the number of large wildfires. We have a graphic. Uh, we've seen uh, the number of fires over 100,000 acres increase, increase pretty dramatically since 1990. Uh, you can see in this graph here the uh, increase since 1990. The, the blue diamonds indicate the number of fires over 100,000 acres. 
those are the very expensive fires, those are the very troubling fires, and many of those fires are the ones that we're talking about, like in Southern California, with uh, nearly 2,000 homes burned uh, just in the last week and a half. Um, may I ask, do, do you think that uh, CO2 emissions are, without question, contrib uh, contributing to global warming? I'm not a scientist, but I can say that we have measured certainly CO2 emissions from fire. We've measured uh, carbon monoxide and methane, along with other volatile gases, and they should be of a concern to all of us. Um, well, you know, it's six months since the Supreme Court rendered its decision in Massachusetts versus EPA, uh, asking the EPA to make a ruling on whether or not CO2 is a danger. Uh, and it has yet to do so, and as a result, has yet to have to then make decisions as to what it's going to do about it. So that really does create some problems um, uh, for us. Um, I solicited some questions online yesterday, and I wanted to share one with you from someone who lives in Missouri. Uh, he was concerned that as global warming widens the area subject to wildfire conditions, it could reach into areas of his state and other states that are not used uh, to having wildfires and are ill-prepared to fight them. If climate change expands the number of areas at risk of wildfires, it could take many communities by surprise. What areas of the country should begin to contemplate wildfires for the first time, and what can be done to educate other communities unaccustomed to wildfires? Well, the Congresswoman from Michigan mentioned the lake states, and certainly we had some pretty active fire in northern Minnesota this summer. The northern latitudes in the boreal forests are experiencing some of the greatest change with climate change, and certainly we need to be paying attention and focus there. The drought across the southeast United States right now in Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, South Carolina, we have, we're experiencing drought and fire danger in a way that those communities are not accustomed to in October of a year. The fire that burned out of the Okefenokee Swamp this, this spring and burned so many acres in Florida, creating not only a huge health risk, but certainly destroying a lot of people's livelihoods, burned a lot of private timber, and fortunately when it hit some treated lands, some areas where the hazardous fuels had been reduced, we were able to suppress that fire. But there are communities, not only in the northern latitudes and in the boreal forest, where climate change is most pronounced, or we expect the effects to be most pronounced. But certainly there are communities ex experiencing prolonged fire seasons that may have been prepared for a two or three month fire season and are now looking at having to prepare for a much longer fire season. Uh, and one final question. Recently, uh, Centers for Disease Control Director Julie Gerberding testified before the Senate on the impacts of climate change on public health. In her draft testimony, she stated that because of climate chain change, quote, forest fires are expected to increase in frequency, severity, distribution, and duration. Uh, the Bush administration removed that statement from her final testimony. Do you agree with that statement? I think we can demonstrate uh, higher severity, larger fires, and certainly over the last seven, eight years, more frequent fires and a longer fire season. Okay. Well, I thank you for that testimony. Um, I thank now you. turn to recognize the uh, gentleman from Wisconsin, uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that my time be given to the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden. Without objection, it will be so ordered, and Mr. Walden is recognized for that purpose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Chief, I welcome your testimony today. I thought it was <coughs> excellent. And I uh, also uh, appreciate the service you gave uh, to the Forest Service in many states, but especially my own state of Oregon and your days as ranger up in Legrand. We appreciate your, your leadership there. I'd like to, to follow up on, on several points. Um, there's a, an Associated Press story out today that says the Southern California wildfires emitted the same amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as that state's power plants and vehicles do for a year. Um, it, it, some 8.7 million tons, which is more than the entire uh, power emissions from the state of Washington, 6.5 million tons. Um, clearly, these wildfires do emit pollutants into the atmosphere. 
and uh, it seems to me that um, your agency needs additional resources and help to deal with mitigating uh, these levels of fires we're seeing in, in recent years. Now, can you speak to the difference, for example, in a, in a state like mine or a region like mine in sort of the arid eastern side of the states of Washington and Oregon and the forest regimes there versus the western side where we don't necessarily see the same types of fire and the importance of, of changing the structure of those forests to make them more compatible with their natural environment that uh, hasn't existed for 100 years since we started suppressing fire. What do you need? What tools do you need? Does HIFRA work? Um, are you using it, the Healthy Forest Restoration Act? Um, and is that adequate? Um, <clears throat> tools. We are absolutely, absolutely using the Healthy Forest Restoration Act. Since the uh, inception of the National Fire Plan, all the federal agencies together have treated 25 million acres of hazardous fuels. That's in the original reports that, that set up the, the uh, National Fire Plan. There was an esti estimated 190 million acres that, were, um, that had excessive fuels. And to date, we've been able to treat 25 million acres working right. with community and community wildfire protection now, plans. Now, we've seen situations like the fires in Tahoe where you had, your agency had wanted to go in and do treatment to remove hazardous fuels and wildland urban interface. What precluded that treatment from occurring? Well, in fact, I was able to visit the Angora fire this summer uh, there at South Lake Tahoe and able to visit with forest staff, able to visit with community members who had been so involved. <laughs> I was able to visit with the, the uh, chairman right. of the uh, Tahoe Regional Planning okay. Authority. Um, I also asked our scientists to put together an assessment of uh, fuel treatments in the South Lake Tahoe area. We actually conducted uh, okay. transects through the burned area, the areas that had been treated pr what? prior to the fire. I'm going to have to move you along a little okay. quicker because I'm going to run out of time here. What, what delayed the treatment? Uh, there, there, the, uh, th there's a lot of very complex agreements uh, in the Lake Tahoe area. There are a lot of complex agreements all over. It's just, it's not just Lake Tahoe. But certainly there's a certain amount of social license that will allow uh, a lot of different activity to take place in a forest. And sometimes there are things in the process that can really hold up, prevent, delay uh, treatment of hazardous fuels. And I think we have examples of that uh, certainly all over the West. All right. Um, in, in fact, didn't they, I, okay, let me give you an example in my district. A, a fire that burned this summer outside of Sisters, Oregon. Came roaring over hill, private land and federal, um, started by lightning. Came down into an area that they had been trying to thin since I think 2000 or 2001. And that thinning project had been under appeal by different groups or a group. Finally, they had gotten through the court system and the Forest Service prevailed and the, and the thinning had occurred. And when the fire hit that area that had been thinned, it went to the ground Absolutely. and they were able to put it out. But it took them years and years and years to fight through to be able to get that thinning done. And it strikes me that much of your agency's time is still spent in litigation and fighting appeals and in the courtrooms rather than on the ground doing the treatment that your foresters are educated to provide. Um, and can we, I mean, we're never gonna get ahead of this 190 million acres of area that needs some work if you're always backlogged. And that same forest actually has HIFRA approved projects out five years and yet lacks the funding to go implement some of those. So it is a funding issue and part of that gets back to how much are you spending this year fighting fire? $1.24 billion? $1.34. And how much now have you had to dip into these other accounts on an emergency basis to pay for firefighting? We had to dip into other accounts $100 million. And would any of those accounts affect work out on the ground? from being done this season? Uh, not those accounts specifically, but the, the continuing effect when you work those numbers into a 10-year average and then you look at your out-year budget, 
Um, in preparing the fiscal year uh, 09 budget, I had to find $300 million to move out of other projects to move into fire suppression to meet that 10-year average. That $300 million comes from everywhere. And does that include coming from how we maintain campgrounds and parks yes. and other recreational activities out on the federal land that and now we're research. having to scramble or cl you're closing uh, because you don't have those resources? And in fact, it also comes from vegetation treatment. All right, then, so vegetation treatment and funding remains an issue that we need to deal with. Post-fire recovery, uh, I think uh, Congresswoman um, uh, Sandlin and, and Ursa Sandlin and I authored the Forest Emergency Recovery Research Act. It was probably, among other things, providing the biggest funding source ever to enhance the science of post-fire, post-disaster recovery. Now, it passed the House, went up where all good bills go to die in the Senate. <laughs> I guess I think I believe we need more research to be done so we get it right and we don't make mistakes. But in the meantime, you have a lot of long-term management practices that you all know what works and what doesn't work. And am I correct that you still have more than a million acres of federal forest land post-fire that have not been replanted? That's correct. And this isn't post-timber harvest in your commercial sale program because that is required to be replanted and, as I recall from the GAO report a year ago, is replanted. So we're just talking post-fire. It's lands, hold, lands like this that go untreated. Now, my understanding on this Egley fire is that there are those environmental community who are telling the Forest Service they won't appeal if you don't harvest more than 19 trees on 140,000 acres. Now, we're still running that out. I heard that But as that's, well. that's what I've been told. 19, 140,000 acres. We've had half a million acres in my state burn this year. This is getting out of control. We have to change federal policy. Or this place isn't going to get replanted. Now it'll come back naturally. You'll hear that. Oh, yeah, don't do anything. You're better not to disturb this. Just leave it the way it is. I, I, I would tell my colleagues, none of a, nobody else leaves it the way it is. Not private forest managers, not county forest managers, not state forest managers, not tribal forest managers. Only we do this in a tribute to burned and destroyed watersheds and habitat. And I just get sick of it because nobody else does this. I held hearings when I chaired the forestry subcommittee. Tribal nations are in, even in my state, hauling out burned dead trees while they were still smoldering. Not the best transportation practice, <laughs> but they admitted to it. The state of Oregon, under one of the most aggressive forest management practices laws in the country, if not one of the first, one of the most aggressive, goes in immediately after fires on their lands and does the rehab work. And how long does it take you to come up with a plan to come in after a fire? Well, if it's not done within the first three years, then the value is such that... Uh, but it takes you a year to come through the planning process, at correct? Least. And at then least. you have the appeals process, yes. correct? And that can take a year, correct? The appeals process should should only be um, uh, 90 to 120 days, but it. Um, but with the seasons for harvest and activity in the forest, it can delay you into the next year, correct? Because you parts can't of the work country, in the winter yes. in some areas. Yeah. Yes, that is summer. correct. And then, too, if if something is litigated and it goes to court, then it can be five, six, seven years. Right. So you lose the value, so you, you don't get the funding into your agency to do the restoration work. And if you replant sooner, you're going to produce a forest sooner, and you're going to sequester carbon sooner. Is that not? Absolutely. Doesn't your science show that as well? Uh, uh, the science absolutely shows that, that healthy, vigorous, growing trees sequester carbon. Those don't. Exactly. And so, Mr. Chairman, I, I hope we can find some common ground here to become better managers and give the Forest Service better tools to make the right decision, not to wipe out everything. I've never supported that. You don't go in and clear cut all this stuff. But there are areas where you can recover. There are areas where you drop them to stop the erosion. They do a really good job on their bear teams coming in after a fire. They'll drop some of these trees horizontally to the hillside so that it'll stop the erosion. Because otherwise, this all runs into the watershed. Now, I know I've used up my time, but I, I appreciate uh, your, your testimony and the work you're doing, and we'll continue to do our part here. Thank you, Mr. Walden. May I add one thing? Yes, please. I did mention social license, and I think the work that's going on in so many communities is very encouraging to me, where very diverse interests are coming together and talking about what needs to happen, what do they want to have happen in the forest that means so much to them. We've got some great examples of that around the country.
but maybe since hurricanes were mentioned this morning, the work that happened in Mississippi following Katrina, working with wild law, working around a common <clears throat> vision of what longleaf pine restoration should look like, we were able to accomplish just a huge amount of, of uh, restoration work using salvage logging and other methods, but restoration work in those longleaf pine ecosystems in Mississippi took a lot of work on the part of a lot of people, but it had very positive results. And you were able to use the Healthy Forest Restoration Act Yes, provisions. we absolutely were. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, uh, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you. Um, and I deeply appreciate, Chief, your looking at the big picture because people are focused on Southern California now, but it is up in the Great Lakes region. It is, uh, well, there's certain irony because uh, the, the governor of uh, Georgia is now trying to short sheet Alabama and Florida by keeping their, uh, what they think is their water and uh, threatening not just endangered species, but uh, whole communities and the fishing industry uh, because they haven't got their act together. Uh, and with the climate change, with development in the flame zone, we're going to see this all across the country. Um, and I, I do appreciate uh, the comments from my uh, friend and colleague from uh, Oregon because there are lots of things that uh, communities can come together on uh, and deal with uh, some uh, absolutely non-controversial uh, treatment on the urban fringe. Uh, and we might actually be able to extract some uh, woody biomass that will help with uh, some of our other fuel issues. Um, but I guess we can't do this if you're going to be spending more and more and more of your money that you're charged with managing uh, on a problem that is getting ever larger um, because it's not just smart forest uh, practices that impact uh, fighting fires. My, the figures I've given, for example, you had a 600-acre uh, fire in uh, the Jedediah Smith wilderness that costs maybe $20,000 to fight when you're dealing with 600 acres. Um, uh, it, uh, in contrast, there was a 250-acre fire near the town of Wilson, Wyoming, that uh, cost uh, more than 10 times as much because of the proximity. And there are orders of magnitude, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that we can be looking at orders of magnitude that are 100 or 1,000 times greater because of the infrastructure and the people involved. Is that correct? Do I have that right? Certainly, it's much more expensive where you're up against de uh, community development, yes. And you're already cannibalizing the budget to deal, I mean, I don't, uh, to, you're making difficult priority decisions. We're making very difficult <laughs> priority decisions that in undercut. order to be able to have funds to be able to suppress fires when they are up against those communities. But they are undercutting the long-term issues of health and recreation, research. I mean, you're, you're having to thin all of your activities with this exploding problem. We've made some very difficult adjustments, yes. I was struck in your testimony where you talked about the 22 million acres of rural private land within 10 miles uh, of uh, the Fort National Forest that are projected to undergo very significant increases in housing density over the course of the next two decades. Is the fire service, I mean, excuse me, the forest service, how could I make that Freudian slip? Is the forest service developing some policies, programs, recommendations to us to deal with this impending massive complication for your already difficult task? Uh, let me offer two different things. We're getting ready to, uh, we've, we've just published this, National Forests on the Edge. We'll be publish, publishing our open space strategy next month. It contains several different things. 
One of those is that we've been working very diligently with a number of different bodies looking at things like environmental services, looking at carbon, carbon markets. We have the science that we can bring to that discussion and we've been doing that. We've been wor very, working very hard to bring science around carbon accounting, science around water, science around all the different things that people take for granted coming from forest lands, whether they're public or private. With our open space strategy, uh, we're, we're um, addressing in a very real way what's happening with forest land across the United States. There are 800 million acres of forest land now, in the United clear, States. Let me be clear, because my time is running. Are you formulating specific policy recommendations to help solve the problem, not, not quantifying it? I appreciate the research, but policy recommendations that would make this problem go uh, diminish. Make it diminish. I think forests are so important, you'll find in that open space strategy quite a number of suggestions for policy consideration in there. Certainly there are things that we will take on as an agency, but there are some things much bigger than we are as an agency that, that hopefully the U.S. Congress will address. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I apologize. We have a Ways and Means markup that is going on now, but it, my slipping away is uh, is not any reflection on how I think this is a critical hearing, and I hope that there's a way to f focus broader attention on the wide range of issues here, and I really appreciate you putting it on. Well, we thank you for being here because you have a long career in focusing on these issues, and it helps us to hear your uh, questions and comments on, uh, to the witnesses. Thank you. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the general lady from Michigan, Ms. Miller. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Chief Kimball. We certainly appreciate uh, your expertise uh, on this issue. Uh, I am not an expert on the issue, but uh, ho and hopefully this question is, is, uh, is appropriate here. But I'm just trying to understand, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned about uh, housing density and uh, increasing house housing density, people moving into uh, areas that are heavily forested. And uh, I, along with the rest of the nation, watched with sort of morbid fascination on the TVs watching this whole thing happen in Southern California. And there was a lot of talk about uh, vegetation and undergrowth that normally would either burn off or naturally be destroyed or die off in, in some format. But because there are more people living there now, that is not happening. And so it essentially act as an accelerant uh, for some of these fires. I mean, because we've had the Santa Ana winds forever. It didn't, they just didn't happen this at this time. I'm just wondering um, what your thoughts are about having uh, such a significant amount of uh, uh, people moving into heavily forested areas. And I ask that question in this context, coming from the Great Lakes. We just had a big debate here uh, about flood insurance. And um, many people were saying, why is the federal government continuing to pay for housing that is destroyed in floods that are going to happen? I mean, there's no secret it's going to flood again at some point and people rebuild. Uh, and, and I am, I, I actually came from local government. I am a huge believer in local control and uh, planning, uh, zoning ordinances, uh, having uh, the impetus and uh, coming from uh, local planners, planners, et cetera. But do you think that, that there is anything that may be appropriate for the federal government to do uh, to dissuade uh, people to, from continuing to move into uh, heavily forested areas that we uh, may know are going to have a forest fire in the, in the future? Well, the Forest Service, in working with the states and with local agencies, has worked very diligently on FireWise. It's a program by which we advise local landowners, local communities on different things where they might structure ordinances, where they might uh, uh, talk about building materials and, and vegetation around homes. And many communities have adopted those. Many people have implemented those around their own homes, whether or not their neighbors have. But certainly all that work in FireWise has been very, very important. At the same time, we're talking about a population that is now 300 million people, and by the middle of the century, maybe 400 million people or more. All those people are going somewhere, and the national forests, forest lands provide a real draw to people seeking amenity values. And so we find in, that, in this report, National Forests on the Edge, but we have a companion report that's about all of America's forests, 
people are seeking out amenity values and locating, you, because telecommuting is such a possibility now, and wireless is available in so many places, people are choosing to live in those forested environments, but they need to do that with the understanding of what they're moving into and with the understanding that they need to be very aware in treating the landscapes around them. Thank you very much. Yes, and I yield the balance of my time to uh, the gentleman from Oregon. Thank you. I, I just want to follow up because the, the question came up about wilderness, and I know we've had some fires that originated in wilderness. What can you do to manage uh, bug infestation, overstocking, disease, and dead trees in a wilderness area? Um, we do not manage uh, natural processes in the wilderness areas. By statute, those are managed by Mother Nature. And so when a fire breaks out in a wilderness area, are you able, um, I, I know technically you're allowed to uh, uh, involve aggressive firefighting tactics, um, but generally that's reserved if there's life or, or casualty. I mean, isn't that right? Don't, don't you employ different firefighting tactics in a wilderness area versus outside a wilderness area? Uh, we do, but again, that's based on the values at risk. We go through quite an analysis at the start of a fire to look at values at risk and then assign tactics and strategies. So if you're in a very uh, expansive wilderness area, there are some gentlemen here from Montana who are probably breathing smoke most of the summer, and they'll remember uh, the fires this summer in a number of different wilderness areas that did not have aggressive firefighting technique until there were significant values at risk. Generally, you let those burn if they're in a wilderness area. Generally, correct? we manage the edges to avoid having them become something much bigger than, than uh, to be burning other resources to be getting into we, other resources. Because it seems like we're seeing more and more of these lightning fires originate uh, in some cases in the wilderness areas where there, there have been um, some problems with drought and bug infestation and no management um, and those come roaring out of there then into other forested areas, private and public. Are you there, seeing that? Yes, there have been some examples of that, and certainly in Southern California, because of the immediate values at risk on the very edge of the wilderness boundary, there are some times when we've employed more aggressive firefighting techniques than perhaps were experienced this summer in the Bob Marshall Wilderness Area there in Montana. But yes, we've seen some examples, because those forests within wilderness areas are undergoing all the same stresses with climate change, that forests outside wilderness areas are, they're just as susceptible to a lightning but strike. But with none of the management activities. Uh, correct, without the management activities, right. including without the access. And I'm sure there are fires start outside the wilderness area and burn in too. I'm well, not saying yes, that there doesn't are a few happen examples. too. Yeah. Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from uh, South Dakota, Ms. Hersas Sandlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chief uh, Kimball, thank you very much for uh, your work and your service. I also want to commend to you the terrific work of the Forest Service officials uh, in the Black Hills National Forest and the great work they're doing with their local partners, including uh, the local timber industry, uh, to pursue a number of thinning projects in the wildland urban interface. Just a few weeks ago, in addition to um, in having Mr. Walden uh, in South Dakota, a couple of years ago, Mr. Norm Dix, uh, uh, Chairman Dix was in South Dakota just a couple of weeks ago and was also very impressed uh, with the efforts there and looking forward to working with him and with you as it relates to uh, the budgets necessary to not only fight fires uh, but also to continue with these important projects, particularly when they do involve commercial timber sales that actually allow receipts uh, that can continue with additional projects and the, the patchwork uh, that we have in the Black Hills National Forest. Um, I certainly uh, empathize with the folks in Southern California. As you know, we had a devastating uh, fire in the Southern Hills uh, near Hot Springs that resulted in a number of homes and other structures lost, as well as a gentleman who lost his life, firefighters who were injured. Uh, and so I come at this being convinced by the science uh, that climate change has led to the increased frequency, the increased severity of these fires which while we haven't hammered out the precise and, and best solution yet on how we manage carbon by placing a price on carbon, but I'm also convinced that as climate change has exacerbated drought, insect infestation, uh, the fuel load, the timing of the snowmelt, that we also have to manage carbon 
not only to reduce the threat of the forest fires, but to enhance the potential of our national forests as carbon sequestration, as carbon sinks. And so I wanted to probe with you an area that I think is very important uh, and, and has vast potential, and that's biomass. Okay. Now, every forest is unique, and the ponderosa pine regenerates itself at a, a significant pace. And I have been told um, by some that I've been working with as they're trying to partner to figure out in the Black Hills, do we have sufficient biomass to support either cellulosic fuel production or for uh, renewable electricity generation, that the average amount uh, of woody biomass just from the slash piles that exist would be sufficient uh, to maintain uh, some amount of electricity generation if a project was pursued there. Can you talk about what activities the Forest Service is undertaking to assess the potential of wood waste as a source for biomass, either for fuel production, cellulosic fuel production, or electricity generation? Um, and uh, do you have any barriers currently that may inhibit uh, moving forward if, if your assessments and research suggest that that would be a good source to help reduce the fuel load. Thank you. And I can start into that. And if I'm not getting into enough detail, I'm going to have to ask uh, Dr. Kennard to join me. So um, actually, we're doing quite a bit at the Forest Products Laboratory in Madison, Wisconsin, and looking at the opportunities for using woody biomass for ethanol. And the, the, the technology is very, very close. There are people in Georgia, uh, not Forest Service people, they're private uh, interests in Georgia working on the very same or similar kind of technologies ready to go into production just as soon as that technology is, is um, is, is, is more certain. Um, a, a barrier right now, the, the, let me back up a little further, it would require not only those slash piles from the Black Hills National Forest, but would require woody biomass from all forest lands. If we were able to access those woody product, those, that woody biomass that's not currently being used for other products and is excessive to the needs for soil processes and wildlife habitats and those kinds of things, we estimate that we can offset up to 15 percent of the fossil fuels currently being burned um, with the use of woody biomass for ethanol. Now there is a measure in there, though, of uh, the price of oil. And so it, it's all, uh, all of this works together. I'm no economist, but all of this works together. And it's dependent, the efficacy of the technology is also dependent on the price of oil and its competitiveness. Thank you uh, for that response. And then if you could address um, maybe two other issues, the, not just in terms of the potential for biomass, uh, but then the thinning projects that are undertaken um, and reducing the density of the stands. Do you feel that you have sufficient research, research or you're pursuing that uh, that would suggest that by thinning uh, and reducing the density of the stands that that enhances uh, the carbon sequestration potential of, of the forest? In fact, we've, uh, we've got some, some excellent science that demonstrates that exactly. Most recently, an article was published in the Journal of Forestry by Dr. Susan Stout, who's one of our project leaders in Pennsylvania. And she had looked at different uh, management regimes in the Allegheny hardwoods and was able to demonstrate that she could maximize carbon sequestration with a managed stand. And she had different silvicultural regimes that she had looked at in that. But you know, Susan's study isn't the only one. There are many other studies that will demonstrate something similar. We do not have science for every single forest ecosystem that we do manage, and we're, we're continuing to work on that part of science. Thank you. And one final question. I know you had stated on page three of your written testimony that there are important knowledge gaps that we need to address, including the estimates of fire emissions that do vary widely. Do you have any, in terms of the AP article that I believe Mr. Walden cited, uh, in terms of the amount of emissions of the Southern California fires as compared to the amount of emissions by power plants in that state, do you have any comments uh, on um, the, the statistics cited in that Associated Press article. May I ask Dr. Kennard? Please. I 
Again, uh, Dr. Kennard, could you please uh, identify yourself for the record? Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Susan Connard from the U.S. Forest Service. So the question, could you repeat it again? Thanks. Yes, uh, very quickly, uh, the chairman's being indulgent in letting me ask this final question when my time was about to run out. But based on the, the knowledge gaps that I think, you know, there's some consensus. The, the estimates are varying widely on the amount of emissions from the wildfires. Uh, so do you have any comments specifically? I don't know if you've seen the Associated Press article yet that sort of compared the amount of emissions from the Southern California wildfires to the amount of emissions of power plants, I believe, I think it's cited in the state. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on, on where you're headed with the research as it relates to identifying the amount of emissions from the wildfires? Um, sure. And I, I actually haven't seen that particular article. We do have some independent estimates that we consider quite preliminary that the emissions from the Southern California wildfires so far would be equivalent to about 3 to 5 percent of the fossil fuel and CO2 emissions in the United States in a typical year. So that's probably a similar number. Uh, the, in terms of estimating emissions nationally from wildfires, there are a number of different lines of work. Probably some of the most promising involves combining remote sensing information with information on models and measurements of fuel consumption in individual fires. And, and as that work proceeds, the numbers get more and more similar from different studies. But I think right now, if you looked in the literature, you'd see a variation of maybe two or three times in the estimates. Great. Gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just quickly want to ask a couple of questions before uh, our votes get called. Uh, Chief Kimball, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Um, and I heard or read that uh, around Lake Tahoe, that area of forest uh, that the Angora fire uh, burned, uh, had received last winter 29 percent of its average snowpack. Was that about right? Uh, uh, I can't confirm that number, but I know that it was a reduced snowpack. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it, it's been mentioned in your testimony and, and, and others' comments that uh, either reduced snowpack or earlier snow melt obviously um, causes a drier uh, forest and a longer fire season. Um, if you uh, could comment on thinning, there's, you know, different people have different ideas of how to thin, and I believe uh, somebody here on or members on both sides of the aisle are talking about thinning the uh, underbrush and the dead trees and the, you know, removing fuel. Uh, there are also those who would like to thin by taking out commercially viable trees. And I just wondered if you would comment on uh, the, how beneficial it is to re remove healthy, large, commercially viable trees in terms of uh, preventing or slowing fires. Everything depends on the site you're working on. And if your goal is to have healthy, vigorous trees on the, uh, it, it, when you're finished with whatever project you're undertaking, then you're going to be looking at a number of things. And one of those is available moisture. Um, it's uh, the surrounding country, what you have on that site, what you anticipate might be a successful tree species or a successful uh, individual tree. Um, into the future, using the predictions of temperature, moisture, all those things. So it's going to vary from site to site. There are some sites that, that uh, would be able to support all of what some people might want to define as larger. There are other sites that might be able to support a smaller number of trees. If a stand starts out at 6,000 stems to the acre and it can reasonably support 40 large trees, there is a process of elimination when you get to those 40 large trees. Mother Nature has had a very interesting way of doing that on her own, and yet now we have people living in and amongst those forests. So if the goal is to have a healthy, vigorous forest, it, um, it's going to be very important that the 
silviculturist, the person who's writing that prescription is aware of what's happening there in temperature, water, soil processes, and all those things. So as Mother Nature makes the choice, we might want to help in terms of removing the ones that don't make it from sprouts to full-size trees. Well, one of Mother Nature's tools is fire. Right. Uh, I wanted to ask just quickly uh, if there are any natural enemies of the bark beetles and other insects who've been uh, decimating the forests who perhaps are no longer there and whether they could be reintroduced. One of the things that we have been seeing with climate change is some real difference in bird activity. When birds are nesting, where they're nesting, what elevation they're nesting. And for some of these insects that are forest pests, um, that's how they're classified, uh, birds are an important part of that control mechanism. Um, we're also seeing that with temperatures, many insects are having two breeding seasons in a year instead of one. Uh, so for, you know, some of the natural uh, controls have been temperature, and, um, you know, certainly that's something we've seen in much of the, well, actually we see it in Georgia, and we see it in Montana, multiple broods of insects that aren't part of our historical information. Uh, but also we're seeing the movement of birds and just trying to figure out how those birds are now interacting with the insects they're moving around. There are also, there are viruses, there are fungi, there are uh, other insects that are, um, that prey on maybe the damaging insect. Had a fascinating conversation with one of our researchers who had just been to China looking for tiny, tiny, tiny little insects that feed on emerald ash borer. And the emerald ash borer, if you're in the lake states, is just a huge threat to, to the, the uh, urban forests uh, all over the eastern uh, United States. So it, there are a lot of natural enemies. We are working with those and also examining what's happening with climate change that changes the efficacy of all of those. And, and you would say that increased temperature uh, would make all of these, the insects, the viruses, the fungi, uh, have uh, more uh, opportunity to attack the forests? Uh, it makes things different. And uh, that's the part that we're continuing to work on the science on. For some insects, like pine beetle, it has made them uh, greater in number and covering larger areas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, gentleman's you. time has expired. We'll have time to recognize Mr. Inslee and Mr. Cleaver each for five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you, Chief. I've appreciated your testimony, but I have a lot of sadness about it. Um, for a couple reasons. One, I've seen firsthand the devastation that climate change is causing our forests. I was up in the Chelan, Hirwanachi National Forest last summer at Robin and Tuck Lakes, places I've been for decades, and now seen it ravaged by these beetles. Literally one fallen off my hat as I was talking to the forest ranger, and I said, what cut all these trees? He said, look at the brim of your hat. And there was a little, you know, worm falling off the brim of my hat. I was in the sawtooth in Idaho last winter, talked to a guy who's now having to build these fire breaks because of the enormous beetle kill associated probably with climate change in Idaho. So I see this firsthand. It's, it's very painful to watch the unfolding death of our forests. And what I have real sadnesses about is despite your best efforts and the best efforts of the great people who work for you in these forests, the policies of George Bush are dooming these forests. And it doesn't matter what you do, as long as George Bush stands in the schoolhouse door and prevents us in Congress from doing things to stop global warming, these forests are going to die. It doesn't matter what you do. The forces are too great. As long as George Bush allows unchecked CO2 emissions into the air, these forests are going to die. And so I have a great sadness about the position you're in of trying to save something that's unsavable when the President of the United States won't help us deal with this mortal threat to these forests. When I say mortal, I mean mortal. Dead trees. You go up to the northern Washington, you see miles of dead trees up there right now. Same thing in Idaho. I don't know if George Bush has ever looked at that. And I want to I wanna enlist you to really do something about this that can succeed in saving these forests. So I want to ask you to do what you can to really impress upon the President of the United States how destructive his policies are to these forests. 
So I just want to ask you, have you told George Bush personally that his policies are killing the forests over which you have a stewardship responsibility? No. Uh, uh, it's a start. But uh, I, I have been very outspoken about the need to have healthy, vigorous, growing forests. And there are a lot of different tools that we've talked about today to have healthy, vigorous, growing forests. It's so important to be cleaning carbon emissions from the air. It's so important to be sequestering carbon to have healthy, vigorous forests, not just on national forest, but on all 800 million acres I, I agree of with forest. you. I agree with you. But what I'm trying to say is no matter what you do, and I think your intentions are noble here, no matter what you do and all the great people work with you, as long as this, this climate is changing to entirely different regimes in these areas, you know, they're going to be dead. And I want to know whether, would you be willing to try to get in to see the President of the United States and personally tell him and show him with pictures the devastation that are happening in these forests so that maybe he would start to work with us to solve this problem? Would you do that for us? I would certainly be willing to invite the President of the United States to come visit some national forests with me and some of my expert staff to look at the health of forests across the United States. Well, I, I'm thrilled by that, and I hope you will do so, and, and I hope you'll let us know what the, what the President's response is, because we need his help to solve these problems in these forests. Thank you for that. I wanted to, as far as what is happening to cause these forest fires, I wanted to put in the record, Mr. Chair, an article uh, by uh, Dr. A.L. Westerling and several others from the University of California in Scripps that basically looked at the fire. This came out in Science Express in uh, July 6, 2006. And they looked at these records, and they, and they found that um, the greatest increases in the fires were in the mid-elevation northern Rockies forest, where land use histories have relatively little effects on fire risks and are strongly associated with increased spring and summer temperatures and an earlier spring snowmelt. That's an abstract of this article. Basically, what this article suggests is that the, the huge increase in forest fires we're experiencing probably are more associated with climate change than anything else of, of, of um, uh, increased spring and summer temperatures and an earlier spring snowmelt for drier forests. Now, that to me means that even if we do better silver culture, it means our, our forests are going to die if we don't solve this problem. So I appreciate your offer. I'm going to follow up with you to, to, to see what happens with it. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired, and we just have time to, to also recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ch uh, Chief, for your presence here. Uh, and we're running late, so I'll. I'll um, we, we uh, an, an, a, mem a number of us uh, on this committee, select committee went to Greenland uh, a few weeks ago and uh, painfully listened to uh, some Greenlanders talk about how uh, indigenous fish were leaving uh, the uh, area uh, in search for colder uh, water. Um, and, and, and listening to you, uh, you didn't quite get there, but uh, are there certain species of, of birds that are now uh, going uh, uh, further and further northward, maybe even into Canada, uh, because they, the, 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 the warming climate just is not conducive to reproduction and uh, hunting and so forth? We have, we have very good evidence that there are a number of birds that are changing their use patterns, changing their habits. Fish, we're very concerned about. Uh, it's been estimated that a two degree temperature rise in, in, in the waters that support many of our trout fisheries uh, would no longer be able to, if it, there was a two degree rise, it would no longer be able to support those trout. Uh, so we're very concerned about all of that and uh, have been studying it. Um, grizzly bear in the Yellowstone ecosystem uh, have used for decades the seeds from white bark pine. Well, white bark pine is moving higher and higher in elevation, and those lower in elevation are no longer thriving. And we're very concerned about that, and we've been studying that. So these are all pieces of the climate change picture that we do have science uh, resources assigned to, um, and we need to learn more about it. I was recently in Aspen, and, and they've killed 12 bears uh, over the summer, 
uh, bears who are now coming down into the city um, because of the bark and, 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 and the inaccessibility of uh, their food. And so coming, coming into conflict with humans will result in, 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 in some killing. I, I, I could talk to you all day, but I, I think I probably should go vote since they elected me to do that. We could talk all day about grizzly bear. Yes. And I did get to Missouri this summer as well, and you've got some beautiful country there in yes. Missouri on the Mark Twain National Forest. Yes, God bless you. And by the way, he's, a, he's actually a reverend, so that means something, okay? Um, from an ordinary member of Congress, it would mean nothing. Um, uh, so we, uh, we, uh, we thank you very much, Chief Kimball, for your thank you, excellent uh, testimony. And, um, and we look forward to working with you uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank so we're you gonna, much. We're, we have a second panel. Uh, we have three roll calls on the floor of the House. We'll take a brief recess, and we'll return in about 20 minutes. <laughs>